afternoon. Uh, please take your seats. I'm still waiting for some more Finance Committee members to come. We'll call the Finance Committee to order. Good morning. Good afternoon. I thank you all for coming to learn about the most important vote you take in your career as a state rep. Remember that we have a special place in the Constitution. All money bills must originate in the House of Representatives because we are closest to the people. So we all get to talk with people. We all get to, to uh, tell them about what we're doing. And they may be questioning some of your votes on the budget. So this is my 15th budget. I was proud to be the chair of the O'Brien budget when I was told to cut the budget 10 percent, and we managed to do that. But this is another unprecedented budget. One of the guidelines we used called a tax, expender, tax expenditure limitations was to look at the amount of time since the last budget, look at the inflation over that period and the population growth over that period, add the two together, and that should be a never exceed number. In the past, it's been running 3 4 percent, and we were always under it in all the budgets. And sometimes we cut the budget to, le to less than previous. We've done that at least once by 10 percent, as I said. But now, we've never had as much inflation in the last 40-some years as we have had now. So when I look at those two figures, what's been the two years inflation? 12.7 percent. What's the population increase? 1.5 percent. Added together, 14.2 would be some people would use as tax expenditure limitation, 14.2. We're not going that high, but we are going to a record increase. I'm sorry, well, for me, a record increase, but not for some of the previous budgets. Why are we doing this? Because everything is more expensive. The diesel fuel, the gasoline, the groceries, and everything that everybody pays. So. The governor, in his executive privilege, negotiated with the employees' union and is giving them, in 2004, 10 percent, 2005, an additional 2 percent, 12 percent. What did we just find out? That's about what the inflation has been. That's what we'd all like to see, that we get an inflation. We did, those of us on Social Security, get an 8 percent year over year, with some reflection. 
So yes, there's going to be some big increases in this budget. I'm sorry to say I'm not in favor of them, but nevertheless, we still plan to cut interest and dividends tax so that it ends in January 2005 rather than up to 2007. There's enough revenue coming in that we can afford that. Plus, this is the closest divided house that I've ever seen. So we have to get votes on both sides or we wouldn't pass it. There are people that hate something about it on both sides. There are people that like something about it on both sides. We're hopeful that there's more people who like it than dislike it. Because I've never had a budget that I loved everything in it. There were things I really held my breath and held my nose before I put them in the budget. But I had to do it to get the votes. There's no other way. We're all here knowing what politics is about. It's never that easy. Even when you think everybody's on your side, especially one of the reasons the Constitution put it here is if you can please most of 400 people, or now 399, then you can pass the budget. We've all got to be involved in this. That's why I'm delighted that you're here. We'll answer all your questions. We'll do our best to explain what we have done. And remember, in this same House, while we were doing this budget, we passed 50 other, bu 50 other House bills that had money in them. When we include all those in the budget, that's another $165 million. But it was voted out of this House. So we are compelled, as the Finance Committee, if all of us voted for something, you darn well better put it in the budget. Otherwise, there's going to be an amendment to add it afterwards anyway, because it was well supported. So there are things in there that some of us maybe dislike strongly. But we've got to keep this state running. If we vote this budget down, then we have no choice. We'll be stuck with what the Senate does. They don't even have to consult us. They don't even have to committee a conference. If we don't have something to meet them with, we have nothing. And some of the things that a lot of people wanted are gone, possibly. So what we're going to do is we'll go through division by division, because that's what we do. We have so much to do on a budget, we divide it into three subcommittees, Division One, Two, and Three, and we specialize each of those budgets in various parts of the budget. We are fortunate to have a lot of returning members that have remembered things that were said and things that were done in previous budgets, so that when you hear the same song and dance, you might be a little bit resistant to remember what they told you two years before and you found out it was BS. So the highlights are it's a balanced budget that does not rely on new taxes or, to, or fees. Committee amendment provides $15.89 billion in total fund appropriations. We're fortunate the appropriations have done well. Some of it have happened in this fiscal year, and we're able to bring that surplus forward for the next two-year budget. Committee amendment provides $6.37 billion in general and education trust fund. Don't believe the baloney because we're trying to align the Education Trust Fund to its historical and original purpose when it has come to be evolved as an education slush fund and people keep looking for places to spend more education funds. The intent of it, when I was here in 1999 when we created it, I was on the committee that decided what went into adequacy and we funded adequacy and we deliberately kept the money that went into the to the, to the tax, the education trust fund, below what was needed for adequacy. Because if it exceeded it, that money was, couldn't be used anywhere else. So we had to make sure the education trust fund just covered adequacy. Everything else, special ed, meals and uh, the, the free and reduced, third grade reading, building aid, all came out of general fund, always, for over 20 years. So these people that are saying, oh, you're taking money away from education, is bull. We have increased the money being spent on education. And we are trying to align the Education Trust Fund with its historical 
and original routes because we can't put everything there when we need some of it in general fund. All the sources of it, of, not all the sources, but the main sources of the education trust fund are the business taxes. Up to 50% of them were going in to the education trust fund. The governor would have proposed to cut it to 35%. We took a look at it and cut it to 22%. There is still plenty of money going to adequacy and a few other things in education that we couldn't pare it down quite enough. So the Education Trust Fund is in good shape and we're able to balance the budget a little better. And we have eliminated, as I said, the interest and dividends tax on January 1st, 2025, two years earlier than initially scheduled. The committee amendment appropriates 50 million to accelerate the elimination of the New Hampshire retirement system's unfunded actuarial accrued liability. And we also hope to put money into the rainy day fund. It was hit to $100 million in this last biennium because of the money needed for the Sununu Youth Center and the, and the Youth de Detention Center to pay for the lawsuits, which are now ongoing. And of course, we don't listen to the lawyer who says more and more and more, but Anyway, there's 100 million we took out of rainy day fund. We're now having to try to build that back up. We hope at the end of this biennium, it'll go back up to 200 million. And if it, everything works out in this next biennium, we might add another 50 million, hopefully if everything works out. So I've got all my paperwork here to help with any questions you have answered. It's a complicated and long thing. So what I'd like to do is, is call uh, Representative Peter Leishman up to brief us on the book here. You turn to part for division, division one, and he's been hard at work because he has the most departments to deal with in division one. And he will tell you about that right now. So, Representative Leishman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I go too much into the presentation from Division One, which you'll find on page six. I'd like to thank a few people first. I'd like to recognize Mike and Melissa with the LBA. They're sitting over in the corner without their expertise and help. I certainly wouldn't be standing up here. <laughs> then those of on Division One uh, that brought this together as far as Division One, Representative McGuire, who served as my vice chair. Stand up, don't be afraid. <laughs> and then next to him, Representative Cam Brawls. And another spot below, we have Representative Ebel. So again, I uh, direct your attention to page six. And what does Division I do? Well, it's easier to tell you what we don't do. So we don't do anything with the Department of Health and Human Services, safety, fish and game, lottery, transportation, and education, and the Lottery Commission. So everything else in government, that's what we try to handle. And I have to say, our group was very bipartisan. When I stepped into this role, I've only been on finance for eight terms, uh, unlike the chair behind me, but uh, I thought it might be very interesting and maybe have become a, a difficult task with a split vote, but it was actually the easiest uh, group of people I've ever worked with, so again, I thank you. So turning to page six, I'll go through these rather quickly, and if somebody has a specific question, if you want to just raise your hand in the chair, behind me will recognize you, I'm sure. So going to the Department of Information Technology, we established a chief privacy officer. This was because of some of the uh, privacy concerns that are going on within state internet access, et cetera. The Department of Administrative Services. Uh, there's an important thing here, probably one of the most important things we discussed within division was the pay raise for our state employees. So there's over 91 Hundred state employees that were uh, based on what we've done in Division One, and our full committee supported giving those employees a 10% increase in 24 and a 2% increase in 25. 
Again, this is a substantial amount of money you'll see at the bottom of the uh, bullet. It's about $225 million. Going to, um, we're going to invest $21 million into the granite place. I think some of you have heard that. We thought it was more appropriate to use some of our surplus money instead of leasing the facility to invest in it by purchasing. Uh, we also set aside additional funds of $1.2 million for uh, work and relocation of staff at the State House Annex, which is under renovation at this point. We also had a significant new ask from the Department of Administrative Services of $3.6 million. That's the last bullet on page six. This is because of our crumbling infrastructure. I'm sure all of you are aware that we have many, many dozens of buildings, many of which need roofs or other improvements. So that was a new request that was not in the governor's budget. Going to page seven, the Office of Child Advocate. We had some additional appropriations there, about a little more than $200,000 uh, for travel and uh, additional funding for training. Uh, this is a very important uh, agency that we oversee, protecting children. So they were looking for additional money that the governor did not approve in his budget. So going to the Department of Revenue, um, we have funded two new positions there. This will, they'll be responsible for out-of-state audits. This will increase some of our revenue, perhaps as much as $3 million. And I'll skip some of these, uh, probably more boring, but again, if anyone has any questions, just sing out. Um, we're also adding additional funding for two technical staff positions through the Department of Information Technology to work with the Department of Revenue Administration. You'll see at the bottom of the Department of uh, Revenue Administration, we're adding 75 million, uh, 75,000 for additional uh, replacement for vehicles, again, not in the governor's budget. Now, this, the next one, the state treasurer, uh, we've heard a lot about this, the Affordable Housing Fund. Initially, this was a $25 million request. We lowered it to $15 million. Uh, back as far as, uh, I think it was around March 12th, we were exceeding the position where we should be by about $145 million. So the division had to find something that cut all the cuts are difficult. But this is one of the areas we um, looked at and we removed, as you can see, uh, $10 million from that line. Perhaps that will be restored at some point. We kept the program in place. Uh, initially, all the funding for this particular item was federal funds. So this is a new um, general fund appropriation. So the Board of Tax and Land Appeals, the bottom of page seven. Uh, we're looking to upgrade their database. This is, again, an additional request that wasn't initially seen, I believe, in the governor's budget. So going to page eight. Now, this is a very, uh, dealing with the New Hampshire retirement system, the division spent an awful lot of time on this particular area. I want to personally thank uh, Representative Carol McGuire, that uh, the chair of EDNA, Carol, was very uh, close with us and worked very tightly with us during this process. We had Representative Pearson uh, involved, Representative Goley, and Representative Jackie Groda. Uh, so this was a very bipartisan effort. And the first one you have here with House Bill 436 came out of the House with a strong vote of 282 to 80. And as you heard the chairman say earlier, we were given bills to fund, and we made every attempt to fund them, either at a portion of the request or their full amount. So we did fund, if you will, I, I like to call this as a, a fairness, fairness issue decision. Uh, for some of you that are familiar, familiar with this, back in 2010, 2011, there were some rollbacks on benefits to employees that had not been vested. We've reestablished those 
earlier provisions that were rolled back to bring them current where they should be. So that was a very good decision, I believe, by our group. Uh, again, this will be totally funded with state funds. Uh, it's about $25 million a year. And this became uh, an interesting working session. At the fund this, we repealed the repeal of the communications tax, which is 28, almost $29 million a year. So we repealed that, uh, which gave us an additional $40 million to offset the cost of these retirement changes. Now, we also agreed to pick up the municipal shares as well. So there's no municipal impact. There was some current concern by the municipal association that there'll be some pushback for them to pay for this, but there is none. Uh, we also uh, changed a, a bill, was it House Bill 50, Representative McGuire? Yes. That um, initially there was going to be a 7.5% payback to towns towards their uh, retirement cost. We thought it was more appropriate to put that money towards the unfunded liability of $50 million. So thought that was a very good move. And then finally with retirement, we had a group two um, cost of living adjustment. This will affect about 3,700 retirees. Um, we thought that, and it's just for one year. The initial bill, I believe, that was brought forward by Representative Broody for about 10 years, but we reduced it to a one-time maximum payment of $3,000. So another issue going to the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification, this required a great deal of work. I think many of you have heard from foresters, soil scientists, landscape architects and many others how upset they were about these changes without the policy committee eDNA really having a first crack at it. So we, re as you can see, removed about 249 sections, replacing several back. And I'd actually like to represent or recognize Representative McGuire, Dan McGuire, who worked so closely on this and came up with some good compromise and would you like to speak at all to that? Or? Yeah, just briefly. Um, we basically left in only things that are very minor um, license changes. Um, it eliminated the hawkers and peddlers license, the itinerant vendors license, and uh, the athlete agents license. And, and it did some cleanup because we're, in general, we're moving to um, a setup where the the administration of licenses is done by a professional set of staff called the OPLC, Office of Professional Licensure. And um, so the boards themselves will be dealing with their technical aspects, you know, what kind of education, what kind of testing, that sort of stuff. But all the administrative work of processing applications, taking fees, doing adjudication will be done by professional staff. And so uh, we left in some of the cleanup sort of stuff r related to, to that. None of what's in there, I don't believe we received any complaints about or nearly none. So, so all the controversial thing about certain licenses being combined or eliminated and so on, that's all going to be for future legislation. Thank you. So um, turning the page to uh, page nine, the judicial branch, we included, uh, basically we supported the, the judicial branch. Again, this is a branch of government and in all my terms on finance, we've generally uh, agreed with most if not all of their requests. Uh, as you'll see here, we approve seven new circuit court judges and one superior court judge. And the one superior court judge came from Representative Lynn's bill, which is House Bill 347, that was passed by the House, providing an additional superior court judge that would be primarily focusing on planning, zoning, land use issues. So moving to the Department of Military Affairs and Veteran Services, uh, 
you can see that we did uh, provide some more general funds there, but it also helps leverage as much as $200 million in federal funds. So this area, they take care of our veteran cemetery, um, maintain facilities throughout the state for emergency issues. Um, and going down to the next bullet, we also included, there was a House Bill 330, some incentives to try to attract uh, former and new members to the National Guard. Going to the Department of Agriculture, Markets and Food, we've added uh, a position to work with the Soil Conservation Committee. We've, uh, going on to page 10, we've included language from House Bill 230 to develop a, uh, an electronic licensing system. This system dates back to, well, I don't know, the, we were told almost the uh, 19th century, but so we're trying to get the Department of Agriculture back on a firm footing as far as their electronic monitoring and tracking. This was another bill that came to us from the EDNA committee, which, I, I'm sorry, the um, Environment and Agriculture Committee on a unanimous vote. Going to the Department of Justice, we heard that uh, elderly fraud abuse is rampant in this state. It's going up more and more. Uh, we added another fraud investigating attorney to this office. This was an additional request from the Department of Justice to try to deal with the ever-increasing problems of elderly fraud and abuse. Uh, all of you have heard about some of the issues around the Youth Development Center in Manchester and elsewhere. We've added additional funds to help the Department of Justice deal with the increased investigation work required to deal with that issue. Uh, going down to the bottom of justice, adding additional victim witness specialist position again to help uh, with the anticipated increase from uh, advocate workloads with the elderly fraud unit. So the Liquor Commission, again, Liquor Commission is primarily funded with liquor revenues and not general funds. Very rarely the general funds find their way in that direction. But we did approve some of the Liquor Commission's requests for the updated commu uh, computer system, the next gen sales system, and funding additional PC software and hardware to help their stores operate, their 66 stores operate more efficient, efficiently. Going to page 11, again, another incentive program, trying to keep our employees with us, so we added language giving the Liquor Commission uh, authority to enact an incentive program to try to keep their employees and attract employees. The Department of Energy, we left that fairly untouched, except we did give the Office of Consumer Advocate uh, authority to transfer up to $75,000 for litigation and contract consultants. You'll see a large uh, section dedicated to the Department of Corrections. We fully funded the Department of Corrections request, and you'll see that we added some additional things like replacement of computers, some upgrading technology infrastructure, we also gave them further authorities to transfer uh, funds should they be necessary, and that transfer would require the approval of the Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee. Okay, going to page 12. I'm surprised Representative Cordelli hasn't had a question. I was just waiting for one of yours, but. So going to the Judicial Council, we did what often people refer to as truth in budgeting. Oftentimes we've let this, uh, we haven't fully funded the Judicial Council because they're another agency that can come to fiscal if they need additional help in funding their operation. We fully funded their request. So hopefully they won't need to come to fiscal, but again, we fully funded their request. Going to the department, of business and economic affairs. This was another area that some of you have expressed concern about. 
this was in Vest, New Hampshire. We did modify this a little bit, making, um, allowing municipalities to seek such funding for construction or towards workforce housing. The original request was $30 million. Uh, this was funded all with federal funds in the past. This is a new general fund item, but we kept, uh, as you can see here, $15 million in that line versus the 30. And as I pointed out earlier, we had to cut somewhere and it was difficult to meet all these uh, additional asks and uh, fund the, all the programs to 100%. So we did uh, take some money here uh, that was in the governor's budget. So the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, below that, there was a request uh, from the State Library due to the condition of their facilities, trying to protect their artifacts and books. They asked for an additional $1 million. We granted uh, their request. Um, and below that, you'll see the, there was a request for $500,000 to establish the Krista McAuliffe Memorial and a committee to raise funds. We reduced that amount to $100,000. And again, uh, with the language we adopted, it prevents nobody from uh, providing gifts or other matching money to help that get off the ground. So going over to page 13. This is something we often see, uh, the very first bullet, fully funding the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I must be getting tired, I almost said agriculture, but uh, so this is the Department of um, Environmental Services, and that's a $27 million grant to fund ongoing municipal water pollution projects. Uh, some of the folks in finance have referred to this as buco bucks in the past because Representative Buco has been behind this effort for the better part of a decade. We also provided additional funding to the department of $120,000. We have two landfills in the state, uh, and there's nobody maintaining them. They've either gone bankrupt, the owners, or whatever, but the state still has an obligation to keep an eye on those landfills and to monitor their leachate. Uh, the next bullet down, a significant amount of money, $2.6 million to the Winnipesaukee River Basin Program. These are funds raised by this district. There are 10 communities in the Lake District. Uh, they have a wastewater treatment plant that the state runs, but they require us to approve any of their programs, even though it is money coming from the 10 communities, and we did approve the department's request for that amount of money to upgrade and take care of some maintenance issues at that wastewater treatment plant, which I believe is in Franklin. Going down to uh, the next bullet, uh, this was another, I believe uh, there was a house request out there, though I didn't note this on my, but uh, PCB assistance fund. Uh, this again was something that the department was looking to fund as far as investigating and remediation of any PCBs in the state. Now we have House Bill 300. And it's uh, an inside joke among the division members that this member was the only one that got everything she wanted. <laughs> so uh, this, I don't know if Representative Ebel would like to speak to this. Um, Representative Ebel has been working in issues of solid waste and food waste and try to reduce the state's um, solid waste disposal volumes and uh, the division after a long presentation and a lot of work by S Representative Ebel supported House Bill 300, which came out of the Environment and Agriculture Committee unanimous. And going on to House Bill 462, uh, this was an, uh, an appropriation, a new appropriation of $2 million to help fund the uh, management fund and also it created a new position to try to, again, uh, limit what we're putting in our landfills. And Representative Ebel, I you know you did a lot of work on this. If you'd like to say anything more. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, and thanks to the division. Um, 
I guess what I would say is that we've heard an awful lot about um, landfill siting, and it's certainly a controversial issue. This is sort of the other side of the coin where we've been working really hard um, through various initiatives with the DES and others to try to decrease the amount of waste that's going into the landfills to preserve our capacity. Uh, the food waste issue seemed like a really good place to start because 25% of what goes into our landfills and weight is food waste. So we thought we'd start small and, and hopefully uh, help infrastructure to receive the food waste to develop in the state so we can do better. And then the second um, initiative is funding the Solid Waste Management Fund. Um, and that is a loan and grant fund for municipalities and businesses to try to incentivize the development of more infrastructure for, um, for diversion of waste in general and for the first couple of years food waste in particular. I, I went to um, a selectman's meeting uh, in my district last night and they were thrilled to hear that this may be coming because they have a lot of uh, things they want to do with their transfer station. So thank you again. Thank you, Representative Evil. Oh, there's a question. Uh, Representative Harrington. You can use one of the mics down there on the table. HB 300 was retained in committee. Why don't we let the normal process go up for the bill rather than sticking it in the budget with, along with a zillion other things? I don't recall that uh, situation, but is anybody, I don't, represent McGuire? Yeah, just, just in general, when, when there's financial aspects to a bill, when, when we send us a bill that spends money, we have to account for it. So the way we account for it is we either, we put it in the budget and then we match it against revenue. And so, um, and sometimes we don't fully fund it or we change the funding a little bit or whatever. But, but by, we can't really very easily just pass spending bills outside of the budget because then our, our finances are not balanced. I think Representative Harrington said he thought I was retained in committee, right? Well, that's what I just looked on the internet. It says HB 300 was retained in committee. So if it was retained, yes. it's so, not going to spend any money. So why do we have to stick it in the budget now? Why don't let the committee process come out with it and see what we'll do next year? No, when we put it as part of House Bill 2, then we retain it, right? So that it's, it's not in two places at once. Yeah? I believe, Representative Harrington, it came out of the Environment and Agriculture Committee with a unanimous vote and passed, and then we will retain it in our division if we're going to act or fund so it. Or keeping maybe... it in finance, right. what right. All right, that clarifies my question. Thank you. All right, so moving on. Uh, down to the last, or almost last bullet point. We have PFAS. We work with a representative, too, from Merrimack, where this has been a significant problem. And we changed the um, loan fund to a response fund. So um, to act more quickly and try to deal with PFAS contamination. There was $25 million put in there uh, in the last budget. There's about $12 million left. We did not add any additional money, but we did change some of the language. Then going down to the last bullet, House Bill 276, cyanobacteria. So I didn't know what that was, but that's lake plumes. If uh, any of you know algae plumes that you may see in the ocean or lakes. So uh, we did include some uh, funding there. Uh, there's a real problem. We got a lot of support for that particular program from a number of different lake associations in the state where plumes are becoming an annual problem and affecting tourism in a very Representative McGuire way. wants to add something. Yeah. So then going to, oh, you want to speak on this one or? Okay. So going to page 14, just a couple of little bullet points again about uh, what I just mentioned on the cyanobacteria mitigation program. So no questions uh, that I... There is something I'd like to add, and maybe I'll jinx myself, but 
in all the budgets that those of us that have been on finance for a long time have seen, we get inundated with letters, phone calls, emails about the horrible things in the budget. Uh, I think most of us average just a couple every day in this particular. So I think that spoke well for the bipartisanship that existed. And again, I thank my colleagues on Division I for making it quite an easy process. And Representative McGuire, I guess I'd like to have a word or two. Representative McGoo for a question. Can you come to a mic? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for taking my question. Was there language about another bacteria right at the end, uh, myobacteria or something? Uh, in this, in the cyanobacteria clause, uh, right at the end, uh, did you add uh, include a, a different bacteria eligible for that? I don't recall, but we could get that answer to you. It's something yeah. that doesn't. Maybe does anyone remember in we the, added we didn't additional change bacteria that language mitigation the bill, fund? So. It, it was. I don't know whether it was a typo or whether you added another uh, something else eligible for those same loans. I don't know if we recall, but we could check on that for you. Do I you don't think we made like any changes to the bill as as passed by the House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Except in the financial area. Right. I think it said myobacteria or something like that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I just wanted to make two big themes of this section of the budget. One is that state government is having a hard time hiring. We are we are um, we are shorthanded, just like you know, every other employer is. But, but in general, state employers in state government, regardless of department, they have a lot of positions available and nobody to fill them. So we did two things about that in this division. Number one is the pay raise, right? So the pay raise should help us fill some of these unfunded positions. The other is uh, technology. We essentially acceded to almost every request for new computer systems. There's, there's new computer systems going on in liquor, DAS, DRA, and others, uh, Department of Agriculture. All of that should help them with productivity and, and help them overcome not having enough people. And the second theme here is in our, our biggest department is the Department of Corrections. And they're also the, in the most dire straits as far as hiring goes. They have right now only about half as many corrections officers as they need to run our prisons. The, the officers we have are working 60 plus, 65 hours a week. They're, they're required to do that kind of overtime. And in addition to that, Parole officers are coming in and working in the prisons several shifts a week. Um, National Guard members are working in the prison and so on. It's a very difficult situation. And so in general, we gave the Department of Corrections as much support as we could, but with one exception. The governor had in the budget $40 million to start construction of a new men's prison. There's also $10 million for design, but $40 million for construction. It's estimated that the construction of a new men's prison would be a $400 million item. Very expensive. And so we were not, we took out the $40 million because we're not willing to fund a design until we know what it is, right? There was some criticism over the design of the women's prison, and so we didn't want that situation to happen again. So we gave them support for operations, but not for new construction. Thank you. We'll now recognize uh, Chairman of Division Two, Representative Emmerich, to, to brief on the Division Two budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to start out by revisiting the Educational Trust Fund, because there's a lot of emails coming in about 
uh, it, it's been eliminated. It has not been eliminated. It has been redefined as to what it was designed for. Initially, as the, as the chair said, it was set up to solve a legal problem, so we had a fund and the court was happy. Several feeders fed cash into that trust fund. The, by, in the RSA, the lottery is the only one specified, but the, a lot of other income was bled into that trust fund. The catch-22 of the trust fund is it could only be spend, spent on education. So we had this fund, this building, and the only thing it could, could be spent on was education. All was well and good. When I first went on finance about nine years ago, there were 220,000 students uh, in New Hampshire. Today, the estimate is between 155 and 160,000. So over nine years, you can see that's a lot, a lot of students. However, the cont those contributing to the trust fund continue to contribute to the trust fund. Here comes the money, here comes the money, here comes the money, but there's fewer and fewer students. So there's less and less adequacy to go to those students. So what happens to the money? It stays in the trust fund. What can you spend it on? Education only. Well, about 2011, it was a tough budget year, and so the, the trust fund started looking pretty good because it had 150, 180 million dollars. Only we were spending for building aid uh, uh, 50 million dollars, 40 million dollars out of general fund. And somebody said, hey, why don't we put the building aid in the trust fund? Voila, problem solved. This has gone on now for several years, and so the trust fund has about 14 or 15 items that it regularly pays for, 13, uh, 12 or 13 of which used to be paid out of general funds. Well, the chairman decided we got to get it back like it was because, as he indicated earlier, it had become the education slush fund. So uh, there, there was an uh, amendment passed that kind of reordered things and took some things out of the trust fund, put them back in general funds. Everything got paid for. Every, I mean, it didn't take anything from anybody. It just kind of redefined what the trust fund is all about. Now, the biggest the purpose of the trust fund was adequacy. And if you go to page 15, uh, you'll see that we actually increased the governor's budget, and we went along with it, increased uh, uh, adequacy payments by 158 million. So we're well over a billion dollars right now in education support. So nobody got hurt. We're doing fine. We just did some accounting adjustments. Uh, the other thing is the, the charter schools got fully funded. Uh, building aid. Everybody hears about building aid. And we always hear about the tail. Oh, we got to pay the tail. Well, what the tail is, is, well, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, give or take, when the state was helping local school districts build buildings, it participated in the debt. So the state every year participated in a little bit of debt here, a little bit of debt there, and pretty soon the state had a lot of debt we're participating in over 20, 25 year period. That's the tail. That's what we're paying off right now. Uh, approximately $50 million a year that goes into building aid, about half right now pays for the tail. Next biennium, it'll be 20% of it will be the tail and not 25%. So the tail is slowly getting paid off. But as of today, there are uh, 17 school districts applying for building aid. Of those using the, the new system, we don't, we're not doing the old system where we incur a little bit of debt for a long time. The new system, the state pays a, a percentage, but it pays it up front in two tranches. So we, we can't have so many schools we're helping because we're giving the school districts more money up front. So they have less debt over the, their life of their note and we get out of, the, out of their note business. Of the 17 that, uh, that are on the list, three are going to get funded this year, as I said. 
hopefully, uh, if, if we can find more money for building aid, we'd love to help more building aid. But right now, as you see, it, it's approximately $100 million over the biennium. Oh, I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't thank my, my, oh my goodness. I got too busy in the business of the business here. Let me thank our LBA, Mickey Lonergan. He, he's my Jiminy Cricket. I had these notes at the bottom of the page, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. Uh, my vice chair, Joe Petrie. Here's Joe. <laughs> Representative Heath. <laughs> Representative Bean. <laughs> Representative Pobichi Milk. Okay. Moving right along. I'm just trying to think. On page 16, you'll see an item that looks like it should be part of uh, HB 25, the capital budget, and that's the Sugar River Valley Regional Technical Center. Typically, uh, the technical centers, two are done per biennium. Uh, however, sometimes this particular biennium, this one didn't make the list. So that, uh, that is being supported by uh, the, 20, the current surplus. The community college system. Uh, I was very impressed by the community college system and what they do. If you don't know what they do, you ought to go online and look at some of the things they can get involved in. One of the, one of the great programs they have is called Fast Start, and that is high school kids can start taking college courses while they're still in high school. And they get, high school, they get credit for it at high school, and they also get credit for it as, co as college credits. Uh, quite a few students are participating in this. And one of the things that I learned that was stunning to me is you can go to the New Hampshire Community College System for two years and become a registered nurse. You don't have to go for four years. You can go for two years and be an RN. I was stunned. Wow, what a, a career opportunity in two years. You've got to advertise that, folks. You've got to get the word out. Uh, the uh, well, we st we continue to fund uh, the the promise program for those eligible for Pell, Pell grants. Uh, Eight hundred thousand the buy-in for math learning uh, community program. I'm not going to I'm just not going to read to you. I'm trying to think of it. A lot of this was very interesting, and I could spend all day talking about it, how interesting it was, but it's not finance. Um, the, the university system, um, the, the new uh, chancellor, a very pleasant gentleman, and our old state treasurer, who, who's now the CFO, they make quite a team, I can tell you that. One of the items that has some controversy around it is the $6 million to support the revamp re, uh, or re-updating of the Whittemore uh, Center Arena. As you can see, it's spelled out, this is actually a $30 million project. They came to the, to the state to say, we need to show our alumni that you support us. And they, originally, they asked for $8 million. After we had a little conversation, they decided $6 million was sufficient to get the participation of the alumni and the uh, other donors. Uh, so we had some very dramatic uh, demonstration, uh, visual demonstrations of what other schools look like compared to our state school, and it was, it was quite striking. So we did support the $6 million. And we're almost back where we were uh, back in 2010 of uh, $200 million for the biennium. We're very close. Department of Transportation. Cities and towns are going to get their block grants uh, of the of 12 percent. The highway the highway betterment fund is is funded. Um, I'm trying to think of. It. I got to say, the Department of Transportation at that particular time and the budgeting process was plowing snow, and so their their minds were otherwise diverted because that that's a big expense to them. So. Uh, no, nothing jumps off the page as far as the Department of Transportation goes. 
the Department of Safety, one of the interesting things which was mentioned earlier is they, they have a staffing problem. They're running about 15 to 20 percent fewer officers. And pr the primary reason is municipalities are very willing to pay more. So we're hiring our own state police into our municipalities, and so goes life in the big city. Uh, but, uh, three additional instructors paid for out of the fire fund, and we also are going to get 52 new state police cars. Exciting stuff. Fish and game. We, have, we had to kick in a little bit for fish and game because their revenues are going down. COVID is over. During COVID, their revenue shot through the roof because everybody was outside fishing and hunting. Now their revenues are starting to drop a little bit because we don't have to go outside anymore. Lottery Commission is self-funding. Uh, they are adding a uh, customer database system that comes out of their expenses. Uh, police standards and training is still supported as they're doing the uh, in accreditation program around the state. So with that, if anybody has any questions, you can ask Ken. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chairman Emery. <clears throat> questions on the areas that Division Two just briefed on? Wave your hand or stand up so I can see who wants to ask. Representative Harrington. I always have trouble getting through all these zillions of pages of stuff here, so I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure. The powder mill fish hatchery in New Durham is funded so it will meet its new EPA requirement by the end of 2025? Yes. Thank you. Any questions further on, on Division Two? Hey, I can't talk to you. Yes, if you think this is boring, imagine six weeks of staring at this stuff. Representative uh, Chairman Jess Edwards for Division Three briefing, which is all about health and human services. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, always a pleasure to step up with the introduction that this is really going to be boring. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start by um, trying to paint kind of the strategic situation that we find ourselves in as a state and therefore as uh, Division Three in, in uh, support of the appropriations needed for uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and, and through the Medicaid and other payer efforts uh, to the rest of the state, to our entire provider community. Um, we, we, we started with the idea that <clears throat> the Medicaid and other reimbursement rates are just generally too low. That if you look at the last 10 years of trend, they have, they have been a little less each year than the overall rate of inflation. So when you take that disparity over a 10-year period, we've created quite a gap uh, between what Medicaid reimburses, which is much less than Medicare, much less than the commercial payers, and, and what the state was willing to pay. So uh, the governor uh, gave us a wonderful opportunity. He, in his budget presentations, he said, it, in my budget, I'm going to give you uh, a 3.1 percent rate increase when the demand is clearly more at the 15 percent rate level. And he said, to us that we are free to try to solve the problem. <clears throat> so we, uh, we did in this budget uh, take a big bite out of that 15% ask, and we're delivering about 11%. And we do this knowing that money is not going to solve this problem, not entirely. We have a severe workforce shortage. There are going to be areas in the system that we could have really strong, rich reimbursement rates and probably still end up with undercapacity because we just don't have the human talent to plug into these positions. So on one hand, we have low rates. On the other hand, we have uh, low numbers of personnel. 
And what we've been asked to do is Division Three, and I think we did a, a, a fairly good job of it, <clears throat> is to navigate how we could kind of optimize how we deployed the resources to sort of minimize the pain to the state. Um, this navigation uh, would not have been possible without uh, Mr. Ripple of the LBA being there every day, every night, every weekend, willing to uh, give me advice and, and to support everyone on the, on the committee that, that had questions or requests. And, and, and to the committee members, uh, my vice chair, um, uh, Representative Mooney, who kept me in lifesavers the whole time to keep a smile on my face during the meetings and others. And then uh, Re Representative uh, Earth, who, uh, whose experience, uh, this is his third term in uh, Division Three. Uh, his number crunching uh, is vital. And then uh, Representative Hull, he was here earlier. Uh, Hull is a, a great one for uh, continuously pushing us to, to rethink what we've been doing. Um, our, our colleagues, uh, Representative Walner, Nordgren, Tolerski, and uh, Stringham um, could not be here today. Uh, I think what they may be doing is preparing an alternative view to how we could deploy these resources. So what I'm going to tell you is the position that came out of the Finance Committee. It came out of the Finance Committee on, uh, unfortunately, what I would consider to be a two-partisan two of a vote. And so uh, on Thursday, I, I, you're going you're gonna to hear a lot of debate back and forth I'm, this is one view of what you're going to hear, and, and I hope uh, you pay attention on Thursday because there's going to be a lot of important decisions to make. So uh, to start with the Medicaid reimbursement rate, we took the governor's 3.1 percent. The hospital said that they would forego their share of it if we gave that money to other providers because their biggest issue is they are stuck in what we call an ER boarding situation. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of the ER boarding situation, please. I just want to, I don't want to dumb this down too much, but it's really important for people to know. What, what has happened is that um, we have patients that go to the ER that didn't get care to begin with in their community that they could have gotten. They show up at an ER uh, when they're at the emergency room ER, um, they uh, get diagnosed as being a danger to themselves or to others, so they are involuntarily kept uh, in the ER, getting um, uh, ho holding down a bed, holding down staff attention, but being in a non-reimbursable status because the hospital can't give them the care that they require. So the so the hospitals are just basically warehousing these people. Uh, it's just barbaric. This is not the way a great nation treats its patients. It's not the way a great state treats its patients. The ERs know this. They want to discharge these people, but they have no capacity in the community to discharge patients into. So our priority with the, the targeted rate increases above the 3.1 percent the, the governor allocated was to try to solve first the problem of giving the capacity the ERs needed so that patients could, could move through the, the, the clinical workflow. And then after trying to address that as much as we had the resources for, we went to the front end and tried to address some of the issues with making sure that there are some community care resources in advance of the need so that they don't go to the ER in the first place. But this problem of housing people in the emergency room is, 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 should truly be unacceptable to all of us. And uh, unfortunately, there's not an optimization formula to tell us exactly how much money we should be putting into this. So, so we've taken and given it our best shot. We, uh, we, we started with the 12 million for the 3.1%. We added another 70 million uh, in general funds. All of that gets matched by federal Medicaid money, so it's, the impact is, is, is at, le at least double those numbers on our health care system. Um, as a result, because we gave different 
amounts to different targets, in general, it feels like an about an 11 percent uh, increase in Med uh, Medicaid rate hikes for the non-hospital providers. So that's substantial, but <clears throat> they had asked for 15 percent and probably could have justified it. We had asked the governor starting back in August or so, uh, early in the budget process, to identify bill payers for us. We knew that the, the, that the Medicaid rates were going to be uh, too low. We knew that we had this state um, uh, salary increase coming. So the request was, please identify some bill payers for us so that this isn't all new spending. And, um, and so uh, what we ended up going with is a continuation of what's called a back of the budget uh, general fund reduction. Uh, what we do is we ask, like we did in the current term, that uh, they force their spending such that they can lapse back to us $23.4 million at the end of the term. $23.4 million sounds problematic to a lot of people, but, but I don't think it is. It's, we, it's not inflation adjusted, it's the amount that they've got now. Uh, we wrote more flexibility into the legislation so that they can uh, do a better job of managing funds between accounts. Um, uh, and uh, they, they, they've done the current year at the $23.4 million. That's about 1.1% of all of the general funds. This is, if you've ever been in a corporate world, you know that at any given budget year, you can be asked to cut 10% across the board. So we're just asking them to manage a 1.1% uh, give back of what we're uh, budgeting for them. Um, also, we, we continue the ceiling of 3,000 on the uh, filled full-time authorized position. That kept us from having to add money to the budget that they couldn't spend probably anyways because the workforce isn't there. So, so that back of the budget uh, uh, reduction to me is just uh, recognizes uh, the reality of the situation. Moving on to um, the office of the commissioner, there's something called the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. If you're in commerce, you've heard it. If you've been, if you've been in Division Three, you've heard about it. Um, what this entity is, is uh, got initiated a, a couple of terms ago, and it turned out that we created the most powerful autonomous entity in New Hampshire. It has, under current law, the authority to tax, to regulate, and to enforce their regulation without it really being responsive or accountable to anyone. So, so this is the definition of, of poor government design. So we have an, an amendment in there uh, that basically says instead of them being able to levy taxes on their own, we're going to fund them with general funds. We're going to take a look at the powers that they were given to see if there's redundancy uh, in their efforts, and we're going to eliminate the abil their ability to issue their own civil fines. If they ask a company for data and the company doesn't provide the data, uh, currently that organization has the authority to fine them up to $25,000 per incident uh, without any oversight by any other department. Um, on the next page, uh, we uh, allow the Health Care Facility Workplace Violence Prevention Act to go into effect on schedule. The hiccup here is that when we established this act last term, there wasn't a fiscal note attached to it, and then for some reason in the budget process, even though it was law, it didn't ever get budgeted. So DHHS came back asking us to um, hold in forbearance their obligation to in expend manpower on things like rulemaking. And so rather than suspend the whole program as requested, we just suspended the obligation of the state to, to do its part. And because the private sector um, can, can handle this actually better without us, I think. And they'll figure that out in the next couple of years with this amendment. Um, we spend a lot of money on information systems to uh, try to buy IT uh, productivity. And uh, the big one is the Medicaid management information system where we're spending $20.5 million and that's being met with a $65 million match by the federal government. 
That's all for operations and maintenance. This is an incredibly expensive system. We, uh, it had been in HP2, we moved it into HP1. So for those of you who are following the nits and the noids going, why is Division Three asking for more money than the governor did? It, part of the reason is because there were a couple of these items that were in HP2 that we wanted to put into HP1 for future transparency. A big one, big policy issue is uh, we added uh, the Granted Advantage program, the Medicaid expansion program into the budget. And some people have said, well, why are you doing that even? I mean, we got the a Senate bill that, that passed, I don't know, I think it was 22 to 2, it was a landslide, whatever it was. Um, and it's coming over to us. Why don't we just deal with that bill and not put this into HB2? Well, we put it in, into HB2 because um, uh, currently the federal government is paying uh, a 90% match. A 90% match. That, that, that's, that's the kind of money you can't turn down. Um, but there's no long-term guarantee that, uh, what that match is going to be. This, this feels a little like you know, the old heroin dealer giving you your first couple of hits, and then once you get addicted to it, they you know, start charging you. So that's, a, that's, that's kind of an analogy with the federal government on this. So we need to have a sunset date. So the sunset date on this is two years. The Senate says that it should be permanent, and so that's something we, we're going to debate. Uh, there's uh, an extension of postpartum care for, for new moms and babies from 60 days to 12 months. That's what the clinical research suggests is the right amount of time to make sure that women have the, the mental health counseling and the clinical care uh, beyond the initial two months post-pregnancy. Uh, we have um, a waiver <clears throat> that 35 other states have, have accepted that basically says for those uh, women and children who are in the United States lawfully, that those otherwise eligible women can be uh, able to uh, uh, get expanded care through the CHIP program and, and other services by waiving a five-year requirement. For those of you who know the immigration system generally, for legal immigrants, we say that there's a five-year period that you have to be in the nation before you can uh, uh, are eligible for care or for uh, uh, benefits, and so so we waive that for the health care component here. Uh, all of this under the Medicaid, we fully funded the governor's recommended levels, um, plus some. We we we, we enhanced a little bit. <clears throat> In the division of uh, of human services, we uh, we took uh, Representative Walner's uh, idea. There is federal money called temporary assistance to needy families (TANF). Uh, and it builds up year over year into an account, and we had about $67 million in it, and she had you know, uh, two or three items in here that uh, seemed to be good investments to help support our workforce development by allowing the child care services to hire to, so they have the capacity to reduce uh, wait lists, and then we increase the eligibility thresholds uh, so that uh, more people would be eligible. The two that you see there, the 85% of median income, is essentially the same 300% uh, family poverty level that we've seen in other legislation, but we kept it uh, as a percent of state medium income because that matches federal law better. Same with the next page on the 75th percentile. Uh, we added back into FB1. This is another reason our uh, uh, House Bill 1 is bigger than the governor's, is we took money that had, uh, for the Sununu Center continuing operations and put it into HB1 so that there would be um, transparency and continuity. Um, one of the things we heard that I'm very proud of Division 3 is we heard for the very first time that we were still subjecting... Um, uh, juveniles to a strip search when they came in, and given that we're trying to obtain a trauma-informed therapeutic-based delivery system in, the, in that healthcare setting, saying, hello, take your clothes off so I can strip search you is just not a great way to start that healthcare consultation. So 
So uh, out of the budget that they asked for, we reduced it by a couple of million dollars over the biennium, and they agreed if we gave them flexibility on moving money around within their accounts, that they would go ahead and acquire a full uh, body scanner so that the um, so that uh, strip search is no longer required. I, I just think that's good, compassionate uh, reallocation of scarce resources. Uh, the next item under elderly and adult services, this is something you should go talk and brag about to your counties because this is the continuation of what we established in the current budget. We added more state money to what's called a, a county cap system to where um, in Rockingham County, I was told because of the additional money that we provided, the CFO said that that allowed him to reduce the request for property tax increases at the county level by seven percentage points. I don't know, that's, that's real property tax relief. It's kind of hidden deep in the budget, but you should be aware of it and, and uh, be, be, be glad about it. Our support at the state level for developmental services is sort of interesting. We're oblig we obligated ourselves by law to fully fund the DD community such that there were no financial uh, obstacles to, to have a, a zero wait list. Now the problem with having, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, you can throw money at a problem, and we have, we're required by law, we fully funded it, but there just isn't the capacity in the system to actually provide the services. So one of the things that, uh, that uh, Representative Erf did that I, I thought was, was kind of brilliant is he, he recognized that as we approached the end of this term, we probably had money that we had previously obligated for the DD wait list that could not possibly be spent. And so we're taking the amount that couldn't possibly be spent and we're moving it into the next year to reduce the next budget's uh, demands. Um, acquired brain disorders got additional funding at the governor's request. These are pretty substantial. Um, and I, I don't recall the source of these acquired brain disorder services. I, I, know, I know from my military experience, just being around uh, explosions and other things can uh, create uh, uh, brain disorders that need treatment. That's a fairly expensive line item, a couple of line items. And, um, and, I, I, and because it grows so fast, I'm, I'm going to ask in my capacity on health and human services, or excuse me, HHS oversight, for us to get periodic reviews on how that money's being spent. We didn't have time in Division Three to really drill into it the, the way that we could. On the next page, 23, go ahead. There's a question somewhere. Kelly? We have a question. Yeah, why, is, why is it those two line items not combined, it's a duplicate. So why isn't the, the you know, 92.4 million added in with the 17.9 and then the percentage change? Why is it a duplicate line item on here? Come on up. I, I believe the last one there is, is, is children versus adults. Same services, but for children. Okay, so you just didn't note that. I, I, I believe that's what happened, yes. Okay. Any other, any other questions? Thank you. So, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Wait, thank you. One over here, representing yes. the whole. Jess. You're in Sorry. Division Three, are you not? I am. I was All going right. to make an additional comment relative to the scanners that you talked about earlier in yes, favor. Sir. What's not, we didn't know at first, it's not just about coming in the facility. It's every time the child goes in and out of the facility, which was important, right? They go to see a parent, they go to see an attorney, all of those to go through that same, right, strip search. And it's something that should have been implemented years ago, and it can be relatively easily, so. Th uh, thank you. So I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I just think uh, the scanner made sense. I mean, if we can go through one of these at the airport, I mean, certainly we could do this for um, the, when these kids are incarcerated. On page 23, the top of it, um, this uh, is funding to fund the Na New Hampshire Kidney Cancer Incidence 
phase three feasibility study. Now, I'm, I'm not a researcher, I don't do PFAS research, but what we heard in testimony pretty clearly is that in order to get to phase three, would you believe you have to go through phase one and phase two? And upon completing phase two under particularly narrow criteria, then you go to phase three, which is an in-depth, more, uh, more um, defining, uh, more detailed analysis of what's going on to correlate the incidence of PFAS to the incidence of disease. So it's extremely rare to go to phase three, and we need to do that in one of our communities. All of our communities are important, but we know where Merrimack is located and how it's so close to such a large population centers, or po population centers. So this is, this is a $500,000 to, to, to learn what we don't yet know about the correlation between um, the things in our environment and diseases that we're seeing. Let me interrupt. This PFAS has become such an issue. DES is setting very low standards for all water treatment systems. And I question them and say, based on what? And it's all the studies have been done on rodents. How about humans? Well, there hasn't been enough. <clears throat> so finally, we have a population that has been affected, and we're going to do some human studies. And I think it's very important if we're going to spend billions on water treatment facilities without knowing the real effects on humans. So to me, this was a landmark study and so I think it was very important that we fund it so we can find out finally what are the real effects on humans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the, um, we're almost at the end here. Uh, the, for the Division of Behavioral Health, you'll see that uh, we allocated $7.4 million in general funds. This is above the governor's request, and, and re in return, we expect $6.6 .6 in uh, uh, matching funds from the federal government. That money is going into something that we refer to as a system of care. So for those of you who aren't following along closely, uh, if you reflect back on what I had said earlier about the ER boarding crisis, that what we also, in, in, in addition to wanting to have capacity for moving people out of the ERs, we want to have some community capability that would uh, intervene and keep it so that you didn't need to send somebody to the ER to begin with. We refer to those capabilities, those upfront capabilities, uh, in large part as a system of care. System of care is bigger than that. But what this money is intended to do is, again, to create capacity so that we have fewer people requiring the need to go to the emergency room. And this particular money is targeted at the capacity for our children. The next bullet down, um, there's, there's a, a couple things that you don't see on this sheet, but in the aggregate, what we wanted to do was we wanted to protect the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs um, so that uh, we kept a, a prior legislative promise to fund them at 5% of uh, alcohol sales. They, they've been getting less than 5%. And so what we did was uh, we went ahead and, and added another 1.1 million uh, or so. Uh, somebody did some math on the projections of the alcohol and we came up with what the revenue number ought to be at 5%. But then we did something else. And I actually think this is uh, more important in a way. There were two HB2 items that were put into HB2 that earmarked and directed the spending of the Commission's money on particular items. And so, so I thought, and, I, and the majority of Division Three thought, that that was not transparent enough, that we shouldn't be taking this independent Commission with its own budget process and uh, using it to, so that we could go around the back door and earmark funds. So we, so we killed those two items while protecting the, the revenues, and my communication to the chair of that, uh, Patrick Tufts, is that, uh, you know, there's, there's so many respected stakeholders on that commission, 
and they have such good budget processes. If they want to fund the two things that we pulled out, then they, they have mechanisms to do that without our uh, spending their money for them. Uh, we established for the first time at the request of Representative Talersky uh, some money to go for uh, a local coalition to help reduce, uh, prevent and reduce youth substance use. And although her hometown is, is a key player in Nashua, there are five other, or there are four other towns rather, that are spread around New Hampshire a little bit to give some geographic uh, distribution of that money. Uh, and so uh, there was a request for more than that, but since this was a first time funding request and there was a, some ambiguity around um, the existence of matching money, uh, we, 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 we took a, just a smaller bite at this. Then we get into the veterans home. Um, the, uh, we basically accepted the proposal. We didn't change our proposal uh, other than to give them a little bit more flexibility on moving money within their accounts. Uh, and they budgeted at a census of 225. Again, their, their biggest problem isn't the money, it's the workforce. So that's a consistent theme throughout this. We, 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 I, if you ask me what it would take to fully fund our health care delivery system in New Hampshire, I couldn't possibly tell you because there's, there's not enough you know, uh, analytical math to figure it all out given the other variables. And the biggest one is we don't have the, hu the human capacity in the state to do it. So, um, so on one hand, you want to get the capacity, you want to encourage the capacity with more money. On the other hand, you know that there's a point in reality which more money is not the solution to the problem. And so it just got to be judgments. And, and the, uh, the, the, the nine members of Division Three, to include the chairman when he's able to sit in, we all have our independent judgments. And, and this budget recognizes our best collective judgment on meeting the needs for health care in New Hampshire through the state mechanisms and with, with our, our ability to resource it. So I'll, I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Okay, we have a question right in front there. Hi. Um, I respect all that you do. This is all so new to me. I am a freshman, and I know this is an incredible task. But I have to say the one thing that I need an answer to is we are spending $250,000 to expand the Teacher of the Year program, but we are spending $200,000 for reduced use substance abuse. I understand you have to rob Peter to pay Paul. I just don't know how to explain that to my constituents. Do I say I just don't know because I wasn't there? But that just kind of slapped me in the face a little. And I apologize if I'm offending anybody. That is not my intent. Say again what the 200000 is you're questioning. The, you were spending 200000 for a first-time funding for local coalitions to prevent and reduce youth substance abuse. And we are spending $250,000 to expand the Teacher of the Year program. So, so I'm not able to compare and contrast the two programs because I only dealt with the 200000 for the prevention. I know, I know. I'm but, just saying but it's I, I, I will answer it. your question to the extent that I'm, I'm able to. And the initial request was 625,000 for the five. We reduced it to 200,000. Uh, for the five, that's $40,000 each. Uh, to me, it's enough to try five different pilot projects to, to find if that money can stimulate matching money coming out of the community. Uh, and, I, and I think in theory, we all have said before that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So and can, I agree, 100%. So if, we, so if we can get in on the front end and prevent and, and uh, recover these kids, particularly, uh, I, it's going to save us a lot of money down the road. I agree, 100%. This is sort of an experiment. There are, there are these five groups that have asked for help. They've asked for help on what we all My regard as a very serious issue. My question is, I don't question what you did. I'm just saying that. Yes, I understand. It's going to slap. There's, there's like 11,000 teachers. 
and, and there's also 150,000 students. I don't know, maybe 20,000 are a high school. But we have to try to experiment and see if these group, groups can make a difference. Years ago, I remember we were giving a group uh, a million a year to try to cut down on, on teenage smoking. A year or two later, we said, you haven't, you haven't caused any change. We're taking the money away. The same thing will happen here again. If these groups do well, we will probably give them more money okay. because I, it's I a serious it. problem we all understand. I agree it is a horrendous problem, horrendous problem. I'm just saying it just, it, I question, I, I know somebody is going to say to me, so you're spending 200000 to try to prevent youths from becoming drug addicts, but you're spending 250000 to expand, to expand the Teacher of the Year program. That's going to come to me from the people that I work for. I just don't know how to answer that. And my answer is going to have to be, I, I'm going to play dumb. I'm a freshman. I understand there's a lot of robbing right. Peter to pay Paul, but I cannot answer that question. I just want to show you it's one that stands out to me. And it respectfully, because right. I don't understand it all. Chairman Emmerich may have some comments. The, the Teacher of the Year expansion to that $250,000 came to finance in the governor's budget. We questioned it and said, so what, what are you going to do? I mean, the, the idea was to take the teacher of the year as a, as a speaker, as a trainer, to circulate among teachers and see if they, they can help the profile of teachers improve to be like that teacher. Um, Part of that is paying the salary of that teacher while they vacate their job, which if I was the principal of that school, I'd be very upset about. Right. Because you're taking my best teacher and the best teacher in the state and t sending her somewhere else, or him. But anyway, so it, it's a budget item. Uh, I don't think they can spend $250,000, but okay. that, that's why it's budgeted that way. Okay. It's, a, it's a pilot, and I can't tell you if it's going to work or not. Thank you. Everything we fund has to deliver or it won't be in the next budget. I think you're next in, or she. Okay, over here. I'm next. Uh, sorry, uh, am I next? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Merrill Gibbs. Uh, I represent Concord Ward 9. Um, and I have a kind of overall question, uh, which I try to hold until the end of the presentation. Um, but first, I would like to thank the members of the Finance Committee for all of your hard work. I know how hard it is dealing with the budget. Many years ago, I was director of a small state agency, and I really do know how hard it is to deal with the budget. Uh, but my question deals with the interest and dividends tax. Um, and uh, I'll start out by saying that, of course, nobody gets pleasure from paying taxes. Um, but uh, as uh, the late Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes is reported to have said, taxes are the price we pay for a civilized society. And New Hampshire has lived with the interest and dividends tax for a very long time. Uh, it was originally started in 1923. Uh, I actually looked it up on the Department of Revenue website. And so my question is, um, rather than repeal it, why not keep it and invest the money in those places uh, in New Hampshire where the needs are most urgent. And there are many such places, but I'll just mention three of them, uh, which are uh, what I hear uh, and from what I've been reading, uh, places that have particularly urgent needs. Um, uh, and these are Medicaid, uh, Second is public schools, uh, and I guess my question is there, why not have excellence, not just adequacy, uh, and have excellence everywhere, poor towns as well as rich towns, and uh, the third being affordable housing. So that is a, a general and broad question, so I'm not sure who I should address it to, but I'm hoping that there's somebody who can give me a little more information on that. Thank you. Representative McGuire wants to give it a try. I'll start with the first half of that, which is about taxes. 
Um, in, I think, and I think many of us do, that the interest and dividends tax is the most economically destructive tax we have to the state. So when you tax something, you, you get less of it, right? And it's, it's, uh, sometimes that's deliberate. We tax cigarettes, we tax liquor, we tax sins because we want less of them partially and partially we want the revenue. But um, when, what the interest and dividends tax is, is it's a tax on savings and investment. And savings and investment is something that we want to encourage. And in fact, we have spending in the budget to encourage savings and, and investment. We have spending on affordable housing. We have a um, department of economic development, things like that. So on the one hand, we're discouraging savings and investment. And on the other hand, we're trying to encourage it by spending on it, if you see what I mean. So unlike all of our other taxes, this is a direct tax on the future viability of the New Hampshire economy. Savings and investment, capital formation, is what makes tomorrow better than today. It's, it's what makes things grow in the future. Whereas other kinds of taxes, taxes on consumption, are means we consume less today, right? We have a tax on rooms and meals, for example. So that means people go to restaurants less than they would otherwise, right? So that's not a destructive tax to the future. It's not a destructive tax to the economy of the state in the same way. So, so our argument is this is an important tax to get rid of. Now, it's also important just from a, you know, a PR sort of point of view in the sense that we're known as a state without income tax, but there are other states like Florida, Texas, Tennessee, et cetera, that Washington state that we're competing against for businesses and, and, and uh, people. And so we have a little asterisk by our no income tax and this would uh, get rid of that asterisk. Uh, I guess uh, I'd like to ask for a follow-up question. Yes. Um, but the, then the obvious next question is, what revenue are we replacing it with? What, what, what revenue we're replacing it with? Yes. We so it specifically in the governor's budget, um, it started out with, re, with eliminating the communication tax. The communication tax is a tax on telephone calls. Right, so it's a consumption tax. It's, it's, uh, it brings in roughly $28 to $29 million a year. It's slowly declining because more and more of, of the cost of telephones is data, not, not calls. And it's a, it's a tax on calls, not data. So that's, it's declining a little bit over time. But we retain that tax. So, so compared to current law, this is a net plus for the state in terms of revenue over a long period of time. It's a, it's a gain in this particular budget, this particular change is a gain in this budget of about $40 million, I think, maybe 25, I don't remember exactly, somewhere between 20 and $40 million. It's a hurt to the next biennium's budget, but it's a gain from for future budgets after that, future bienniums, of roughly 50 plus billion, million dollars a budget. So we, we did in fact um, have less tax cuts if, in just in terms of dollars than, than the governor proposed. And how does that compare? Um, how does retaining the communications tax, uh, how does that compare in dollar amounts to what we would have received if we retained the interest and dividends tax? The difference here is we're losing, remember that some years ago we decided to downsize interest and dividends 1% a year. So it's, it's fading away anyway. We've accelerated its fade. So we took out the 2% and the 1% years because they were bringing in very little. So we're losing 17 million overall by the way we've structured the going away of the interest and dividends tax. and so. That was going away anyway. We've accelerated its departure. So we still have excellent revenue. We have record revenue. 
and it's increased fairly well. So by substituting, as you said, communication service tax, that's about 26 million a year. So we have a gain, as, as you're questioning, it's 26 million in one, losing 17 million in the other. It comes out fairly well positive. Thank so, you. Thank you. Over here. So underneath page uh, 23, under the DHH, DHHS, Division of Public Health, um, Division of Behavioral Health, under the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs, um, retaining that 5% gross liquor profits. So that means like in fiscal year 24 and 25, that's like 22 million. What are they doing with that money? What is that commission doing uh, on alcohol and other drugs? Who's being paid those profits? Uh, what salaries are being paid? Do we know all of that information? Sure. Um, all, all the relevant numbers to answer your question are not in this paragraph. What, what this paragraph is saying is after we meet long-standing, I didn't make the promise, I'm just keeping the promise, of 5% of the alcohol funds going to this commission, it's going to add about $1.1 million. So, so where you see $11.1 million transfer, that's the total. The base was already prepared to be $10 million. Keeping the promise costs us another $1.1 million total of 11.1. So that, that, those are the numbers. To the, to the question about the commission, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on that commission, and um, what I've witnessed over the year or so that I've been on it is that there is a tremendous cross-section of stakeholders throughout New Hampshire who are on that, from law enforcement to behavioral health to members of the Department of Health and Human Services to community providers. It's just, it's a multidisciplinary group of stakeholders that probably number, I don't know, 40 or so. And they have uh, been in business for many years now, and they have produced routinely budgets where they take the alcohol revenues and they allocate it to various things. Like I got interested in how, how can we fund some um, recovery around the domestic violence uh, problem induced by alcohol and drug. And I was very pleased to find that they, ha they already had three separate programs where they were funding different kinds of domestic violence interventions that totaled something like 600, 700,000. So, so I can't tell you the whole thing. I, I can tell you I think that the, the commission's um, budgets are online. They are subject to 91A like, like any of us. And so the, their budgets are uh, publicly accessible. Okay. It's just everything that's over $10,000 is supposed to run through the House. And this special commission, which is millions of dollars, is funneling money into areas where we should be making those decisions. I mean, it's just, I know this is a huge budget and there's a lot of things to go through. But being a freshman as well, these are the types of things that offer a red flag for me and it should offer a red flag for um, our constituents. So. But thank you for so, answering So question. I share the, the representative's uh, interest in the commission and how it's funded and how it, it sort of skirts uh, our constitutional duty to control spending. Correct. Um, but I, it, it happened before me, it happened, you know, or when I was a freshman. You never know what happens when you're a freshman. Uh, but, but anyways, if, if it's something you want to look at in the future, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Thank you. Next. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to return to the uh, top of the interest in dividends tax and the rationale for it is, I understand, is that this will be, make New Hampshire into a magnet for the nation's high, high, um, let's say high wealth individuals that they're all going to be abandoning Tennessee and Florida and California and other states and they're all going to race here. And we also Although we're not doing anything new to the business taxes, that was also the rationale for the business tax, that all the entrepreneurs are all going to want to shut down their uh, businesses in Massachusetts and New York and all come here. My question is, uh, one problem that is, where are all these people going to live? Are they going to crowd out uh, working-age families who are already in New Hampshire? And um, 
And the other thing is, uh, I did notice this budget is free of culture war stuff, and is that partially a reaction to what's kind of gone wrong in Tennessee, what we see going on in Tennessee and Florida and, and other states where, um, you know, their governors have kind of uh, taken on some controversial, uh, controversial issues which, uh, you know, which uh, are not necessarily, uh, not necessarily liking to everybody, uh, including some of the high wealth individuals who have moved to those states to avoid taxes. So how do we, how do we do this? So how do we invite these people here while still like uh, having room for, uh, you know, younger people to live in the state? And what plans have we made for the incredible growth that all these tax cuts are going to supposedly cause? Thanks. So, so Representative Horgan, uh, it's, good to, it's good to see you back in the House. I, yes. I'm glad you're doing well. Yep. I was going to ask you if you had any candy to share with us, but no. I, thought <laughs> too, I thought that was too soon. <laughs> but um, but I'm, glad you're, I'm glad you're doing well. You, you're asking a very broad question, and I think we're here today to talk about budget specifics, mm -hmm. and you're you're, you're bringing up the fundamental issues on the distinctions between at least the, the two primary parties in the country, right? Mm -hmm. And so rather than elaborate to let you know that I think I'm right and you're probably not, I, I, would, I would just say that there hasn't been a five-year government plan ever that's really worked well, and to the extent that we have, that we're able to enjoy the success of, of the society, it's largely delivered by the free market. Mm -hmm. And so the hope is if we can stimulate, you know, the mo money, uh, the movement of mo money, capital, and people into the state, uh, localities can figure out the rest. And okay. as you know, we're trying to work on the housing problem. But okay, great, thanks. And I, 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 I don't know that we should get into a and there is some housing philosophical and debate yeah. on the floor here. Great, thanks. Next question over here. Yes, Lisa Post. And um, I was um, interested in the um, uh, children's behavioral health. Now, you had referenced that, um, I'm just going to step back because I'm hearing myself. Um, you had referenced the other issue with the emergency room being filled um, with people in an inappropriate way. and. Is this what's happening to these children, or are there other facilities for them to go to where that money is, or, so, or do we need So, Representative, I, I just have to tell you, I, I have a very hard time uh, hearing, and, okay. and so what I, what I think you're asking about is a bullet here on page 23. And I'm just going to tell you, I, I have... Uh, an ear infection, so like everything is reverberating in my head. So I'm sorry for that. But I'm just I'm wanting to know if there are facilities for those children already in place that aren't in an emergency room, or is this for money to be put for more beds for that kind of thing? So, so by and large, we don't have as much of a facility problem for the capacity that we're, we're looking to have prior to somebody being admitted to an ER. We're, we're having more of a, a, a human bandwidth problem where we don't have the workforce to uh, maximize the capability of the existing facilities. Now that's a very general statement and in, in specific areas it's going to be off. But as far as the broad brush, I think that's accurate. So, so would it be more uh, a child goes for therapy or something like that? Or is it a child needs to be, um, you know, have more uh, intense uh, treatment? So, so if we accept that we have too many people staying in the emergency rooms because uh, they don't have a place to be discharged, and there are too many people in the hospital ERs because we didn't have adequate care for them prior to them going to the emergency room. We're trying to solve both of those problems. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the front end, you know, the idea is if you can um, get in front of a, a kid and start to provide them with the behavioral health counseling and support and, yes, sometimes some medication, you can keep them out of the ER to begin with. So that, that's, that's basically sort of the, the, you know, the clinical objective of much of this on the front end is to provide them the treatment so that they don't end up in the ER to begin with. So that's more like staffing 
getting staffing? Additions? Staffing is our biggest problem. Okay. I mean, money and staffing, those are the two big things. Thank you. Yeah, that. thank you. Our next, Representative Vose. Representative Vose, this is a general budget question. In 2021, the Tax Foundation ranked New Hampshire 47th in the nation in per capita spending uh, for taxes at $2,313 per person. How will the 12.7% increase in this budget affect our ranking and our per capita spending for taxes in the state? Um, until we know all the other states, we don't know where we stand. I suspect they'll all have to go up just to keep people working. Because like we've seen, I think the major problem we heard from all the people that testified before us, we can't get staffing. Why can't we get staffing? Because they can make more money somewhere else. If we can't be competitive in the wages, we're still going to have staffing problems. And I suspect it's, it's, it's nationwide. So when we see what other states do, then we'll get a, an idea. We, we still have some very good ranking among all the states, and I don't expect it will change all that much. Next question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A question directly to Representative Edwards. Uh, specific to page 22 and the developmental services funding, within that funding, uh, you would clarify the following or answer the following question. The developmental services wait list is do I understand that's within that 830, uh, 832 million? Yes. And the follow up on that is in meeting the current uh, census of where these funding uh, numbers will come from, will this allow for rate, hourly rate increases? Because that's the biggest, as related to other subject matters already discussed, that we are not finding enough people to do the job in home and community-based care because the rate, our hourly rate, is not enough of an incentive for folks to take on these jobs. Is that allowed within your discussions and the funding that was hereby presented? No, but um, when we did the targeted Medicaid uh, reimbursement rate hikes, we, uh, we allocated funding on an algorithmic basis um, to where uh, we funded 20 different lines of provider services, all in an effort to continue to build capacity. Th this, this, these line items are specialized efforts to do that, also with more money chasing uh, somewhat limited workforce, with the hopes that it'll stimulate people from Massachusetts to work here, or people that live in New Hampshire working in Ma Massachusetts to stay and work here. So it's... Okay, one more follow-up, Mr. Chairman? Sure. Uh, just oh. don't know who the authority having jurisdiction is here. <laughs> want to make sure I do it right. Uh, the, the issue uh, was on the, then the hourly rate, and what was the challenge in the last uh, two terms was that we had a cap of uh, $15 per thousand, uh, not per thousand, per hour, is we need to get closer to 20 for this, these uh, issues to be filled, and it, was that part of the discussion? There's two parts to the problem, as the chairman was pointing out. One is the rates that you're discussing. The other is the need. The line item you're talking about is the need. The rates are in the Medicaid rate setting. This particular, all three of these bullets in this particular area require by law that they be budgeted for at the full need, regardless of whether that need can be met. So these numbers that are in here have to be there based on the need, whether that, whether, whether that need can be met or not be met. We can't change around the funding with these funds. What we changed around the funding was on the Medicaid rate setting side, where hopefully that will increase our capacity to address more of the need. Does that make sense? So, so uh, no, as usual. Uh, well, unfortunately, it's the law. I, uh, you know, no, we're stuck with that. No, no well, well, with all respect, sir, I'm very familiar with the law being here uh, 20 years. But the key is whether the rate of pay does not have a false cap and that it can respond to the market so that these families can have these services provided in the home. 
Yes, you understand that, and you, but what you're missing is that that's why we worked on increasing the Medicaid rates, rates right. to increase the capacity. But by law, this part of the budget, there's two parts of the budget, mm -hmm. this part has to be set based on current rates and the need, regardless of the ability to fulfill the need over the, the biennium. Okay, I'll, I'll stipulate to that. Under, I do understand that. It's, are we meeting the challenge? And I don't, that's what I'm concerned about. That's why I asked the question. F f fair enough, but we gotta, if, if, you want, if, if these funds want to be used for another purpose, you have to change the law. That's the bottom line. These particular line items. Okay, thank you. All right, I appreciate your patience while we go through all these fine points on the budget. I, wanna, I don't want to waste the extra dollars we spent on color for these items <laughs> that we spend for the big picture. And while we're talking, the other legislative budget assistants who have assisted in all the divisions, I want to point to the chief legislative budget assistant who overall sees this, and that's Mr. Michael Kane, who is the elected legislative budget assistant. <laughs> and back here by the doors is number two, Chris. I'm going to say the wrong last name. Shea. I don't know why. Shea. Chris Shea done that before. So, so page, page two, you'll see where we're going to spend the general funds throughout the budget. And then someone who's very sharp will question, compared with page five, one says 3.975 billion. The other one says 3.732.7 million, or 3 billion. Why is there a difference? The difference is page two is spending a little bit of surplus from 2023. Page five is showing what we're taking in by ways and means estimates from 2024 and 2025. So that is less money because it doesn't have the surplus included in it. That's what we collect. And just also, page three is where the money goes out, total funds. So that includes not just general funds, which is just one small part, but all the total funds. And the page below that, again, page four, that's where the appropriations come in from all the funds. And you'll see there, the page four, the big blue piece, federal funds. That's a pretty good piece, 32%. So finally, we're getting back a little of our income tax. We don't get back as much as most states, but we get back something. So, all, so those, those things are very illustrative in my mind. I always ask LBA, since I first got on this committee, put them in pie charts. I'll understand them better. So those, those are all very good things to look at, as well as when you go to pages uh, 24 through 35, where you see a lot of spreadsheets. And these are also important in getting an overall understanding of the budget. The page 24 shows the combined statement of general and education trust funds and some of the some of the places they're collected and spent, and you go to page 25, and you see the statement for just the general funds. So that's a whole different thing, as I say, when you realize the general funds are only one small part of the total spending. Then page, uh, page 26, we start to look at schedule one, which kind of breaks it down a little more into where the money is coming in specifically and Schedule 2 shows the general fund distributions across government and where some of them are going by various bills like Senate Bill, uh, Senate Bill 1 and HB 384, HB 504, some of the, where those monies are being spent. Schedule 2 goes on for a few pages. And then the Education Trust Fund has its own three pages, so you can see where the education trust fund money, uh, monies are going, uh, and you'll see that we're not shorting anybody. But these are a very good 
items for understanding. And then the last page, 35, is, is the aid by category where that's going out and all the different uh, types of funds. Some of it's going into highway fund and so on. So I hope this has helped. It's very complicated and an old expression we used in the military, it's like you're drinking from a fire hose. Most of it's going by you and maybe you'll remember some of it later, but any one of us would be willing to sit down and explain any parts of this that we don't have time to do right now. But I appreciate your attendance, appreciate your, your ability to learn all this about the, the state budget. It's the most complicated bill we have, and it's the most important vote that you'll cast. And as I said, not everything in here pleases everybody, not even me, certainly not the governor, because we've made changes that he will probably be upset about. But you have to remember, this is the place where the budget is made, no other place. I appreciated having a couple of senators here to listen, and they've left now, but obviously, if there are things that we look at Thursday and said, aha, there's a new amendment, what should we have done about it? There's another chance. Take it to the Senate. They will listen, and maybe it's such a great idea, you can convince 14 of them, whereas you might not have been able to convince 200 people here. So there's another chance at the, at the budget when we go to the Senate. They'll be kind of speeding it up, but they will be using a lot of what we've done. They always have in the past, and make some little changes to, them, to their own. One of the things that concerns us all, as I said, this is unprecedented both for the, for the amount of, of, of inflation we have to deal with, the amount of jobs that we can't fill. Those are unprecedented. We've never heard so much about those as we've had this year. What's going to go happen going forward? Usually, the Senate sees the, the budget, the uh, revenue from April and May that we don't get to see. And quite often, it's higher. Those are some of the biggest months. If you're on Ways and Means, you understand that April and May, big months, business taxes come in big time. And everybody's paying their federal income taxes at the same time putting aside their state income taxes, business income, business enterprise tax, and business profits tax. So quite often, they can sit there and have more money to spend than we do. And they usually lot it over us when we go to the committee of conference. Ha, you didn't fund this properly. But anyway, I don't know what will happen going forward. People keep predicting recession. Will we start to see it in April, May? I hope not. But we may see it in 24 and 25. So I don't want to spend everything that we hope goes to the rainy day fund because it may be coming. It may be coming in the next budget. We may have a problem. So. We don't want to listen to amendments that are saying, oh, you're putting money in the rainy day fund, we should put it here. Well, I don't know how rainy it's going to be in 26 and 27, and I hope it isn't, isn't as bad as some have predicted. But let's keep that in mind when people want to say, why are you putting money in the rainy day fund? I want it put in my project. Please be with me. We may need to plan a little further into the future than the next two years. So I appreciate the fact that we're all here. We're willing to answer any of your questions. Um, take me aside whenever you catch me, and I'll have this, I'll carry this around with me. Call me on the phone if you want, any of us that are close to you, and uh, we'll do our best to try to reason it out. It's difficult having all these things in the air, as I've said before. Sometimes we fund something, it seems like a lot of money. Two years from now, we'll look back and say, hey, what'd you do with that money? And we also sometimes call for audits from the legislative budget assistant also has a whole other group that do audits. And I like to look at those audits and see, so how did it all work out? And if I find out that the money wasn't well spent, or maybe it wasn't even spent, then we can pull it back. Last year's budget was, was balanced because we found hundreds of employees in health and human services that never got hired. Money was there, but they didn't hire them, they couldn't hire them, whatever reason. I don't even think they had the office space for them, but that helped us balance the budget. So we follow up on all the money we hand out. How is it spent? What were the results? 
Did it work? Please be with us. Anything you find out, come and tell us. We're always happy to hear whatever you hear out there in the hinterlands, seeing all your, your, uh, your constituents, and some of them might be state employees who will be willing to share with you something that they would be afraid to say in their office. So we're always looking for those little tidbits, and I appreciate your attention, and thank you very much. And I think uh, if uh, Representative Osborne may be here to take over for a caucus. Is he still here? Oh. All right. So I believe there'll be a Republican caucus. So I think we have a few Democrats that are probably going to depart. But I appreciate their being here to listen to the budget presentation and finding out all you can. It's a very complicated thing. I'm still learning. Thank you all for your attendance.